This is your UBC correspondent, Edward John, speaking tonight from London. This beleaguered, war-wearied island is now the last bastion of freedom and democracy in Europe. The southern counties have been enduring innumerable bombing raids at the hands of the Luftwaffe for the past three weeks, ever since Hitler redirected his attacks away from military airfields onto civilian targets. This morning, Prime Minister Winston Churchill, addressing the nation, warned that a German invasion may be imminent, but gave defiant notice to Hitler that the people of Britain, quote, would fight on the beaches and fight on the landing grounds. He went on to say, we will never surrender. The next couple of weeks, possibly even days, may be critical to Britain's continued survival. The Prime Minister once again urged President Roosevelt to join the war effort before America is left to stand alone against the Nazis and without a foothold in Europe. This is Edward Johns reporting from London. Hi, Gramps. What are you doing here? Good afternoon to you, Curtis. Your mom asked me to keep an eye on you and your sister. While she ran some errands, Uh, she said that your school snack's in the fridge. Cool, Gramps. Mom, I'm home! Mom's out. Gramps is babysitting. Hi, Gramps! Hello, Princess. Come and give your old Gramps a hug. Yuck! So, kiddo, what did you learn in school today? I wrote a poem and got a gold star and then... I'm reading a story today about this big war that happened a long time ago. Did you know there was a war that was all over the world, Gramps? Wonderful, Brianna. I'm so proud of you. Why, yes, Curtis, I did. It was called World War II, and it happened when I was about your age. I was in that war for a while, you know. Really, Really, Gramps? Gramps? That must have been so cool. Tell us about it, please. You know, Curtis, it wasn't all some kind of grand adventure. Thousands of innocent people were killed by the bombs, even school children like you. And I remember we never had enough to eat. You mean the war was even here in Ontario? Oh, heavens no, child. Thank God it never came to Canada the way it did in England, where I was born. There were never any major battles fought here in North America, but that's why my mom sent me here on the third year of the war, so that I'd be safe from the bombs. It was 1941, I think. Oh. My mom was lucky. She had a brother, your great-uncle Harold, living in Emo, and he took me in. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. I grew up in a city called Plymouth on the coast of the English Channel. My teacher said that the pilgrims came to America from a place called Plymouth. Were you a pilgrim, Gramps? <laughs> oh, heavens no, child. I'm not that old. But you're right. Plymouth is the British port where the pilgrims sailed to America from. I often played on the very steps they walked on when they boarded the Mayflower. Plymouth is still a major naval port in England, and it's the home of many famous seamen, like Sir Francis Drake. I've heard of him, I think. Yes, he was a famous sea captain who saved England when the King of Spain sent an armada of ships to attack England in the time of Queen Elizabeth I. Our Queen Elizabeth? Oh, no, son. It happened way back in the 1500s. In those days, Spain was the greatest sea power in the world, and they had the biggest ships. King of Spain sent a huge invasion force to try and take over Britain. But Drake's smaller, faster ships broke up the Spanish formation, and a terrible storm finished the Spaniards off. Nobody ever attempted to invade England again, at least not until the Nazis came along. But I still wonder if that old Sir Francis may have returned from the grave and saved England for a second time. Really? Yes. I remember those days like it was yesterday. I recall one day I was lying on my back in a hayfield, watching the contrails of planes dogfighting overhead. That was all very exciting to a schoolboy. Blimey, Brian. The air raid last night was a real corker. My uncle was on air raid war on duty, and he still hasn't gotten home. Mum hopes he's just late. Look! Where, Nigel? Up there, just below the clouds. See him? Hurricanes, I think. Maybe Spitz attacking the German bomber formation. Yay, Nigel, they got one! Frankie is firing them in! I didn't see any shoots. Did you, Brian? Nah, and serves them right. They nearly got the pub last night. 
Me dad will be in him for a shock if he gets back all safe and sound just to find his local gun on the smoke. Dad says Buckland's Abbey got hit too. Some of the windows were blown out, and some of the roof on the East Annex collapsed. Will your dad still have his job there? Yeah, and he told me mom this morning that the stuff in there is too valuable to have it get destroyed by a stray bomb. He's putting anything not smashed up someplace safe. Where? I don't tell you when I told you, but him and Mr. Halliday are going to hide the relics in St. Bart's Church Crypt. Want to go down to the harbor and look for spies after school tomorrow? Sure, as long as I'm home by six. Mom gets off work at the munitions factory then, and she wants a table laid when she gets home. Right. It still feels strange having Mom working at the factory, but it gives me more time to explore without her looking over my shoulder and worrying all the time. Yep, it's fun being by myself, too. It's my dad I really miss. It's better since Mom got the letter from the Red Cross saying he was wounded in France. The Jerry's captured him at Dunkirk, so he's in a prison camp until the war is over. We had almost given him up for dead. Oh, that's a piece of good news. Cheerio. See you tomorrow. We'll meet again. Don't know where, don't know when. Oi, get off, you pillock. Don't be so daft. Look over there, just beyond the destroyer in the dry dock. Is that the Ark Royal? It must be. I see five, six, seven. No, no, eight. Eight planes on her deck. Core, blimey, she's a big one. Never seen an aircraft carrier in Plymouth before. Must be getting resupplied for her next patrol. Dad said he heard on the wireless that she's at Scapa Flow. Well, she's a long way from the North Sea now. Look, look! There's a swordfish trying to land on her deck right in the harbor. Yeah, he made it down. Mr. Churchill said that the Nazis are expecting to be trying to invade any time now. I heard him on the wireless. Dad's going to volunteer for the home guard. He told Mom he may not be able to march, but he can still shoot a rifle. Mom told him he'd be more of a menace to his mates than any stormtroopers coming <laughs> ashore. I remember my dad said that your dad was a good shot in the Great War. Bernice, Nigel, can one of you get the door for me? I need a hand here. Hold your horses and let me get my hands dried. I'm up to me elbows in dishwater. Nigel, get a towel and dry the dishes. Coming, Mom. Tis bad enough you going to work after tea for the third night in a row. Now you're bringing your work home with ye. Now, now, Bernie, there's a war going on, in case you didn't notice. And Harry and I can't be too careful lugging valuables around the city after blackout. We don't want any of Sir Francis Gere ending up at the bottom of a bomb crater, do we? What you got there, Da? You get back to those dishes, young man. Yes, Mom. These relics are of immense historical value to any son of Plymouth, my dear, especially the drum. Looks like so much rubbish to me. Should have a real job and contribute to the war effort. It looks really old. Son, this is the most famous drum in the realm. It is over 450 years old, and it belonged to Sir Francis Drake, Vice Admiral of Good Queen Bess Royal Navy, a Devonshire man like you who had called Plymouth home. It is said that he had this drum with him when he defeated the Spanish Armada in 1588. Such nonsense. Don't go fill in the boy's head with a romantic claptrap. He's too much of a dreamer as it is. Get back to those dishes, boy. Yes, Mom. Bernice, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for our son to see some real history, and under his own roof. Let him be. Drake is the most famous man ever to walk Plymouth O. King Philip of Spain called him a pirate, and offered a fabulous reward for his head, even before he destroyed Philip's fleet. The reward was a king's ransom even today, it would have been over a hundred and fifty thousand pounds. The Spanish called him as El Dragon. We know him as Devon's favorite son. He was the first Englishman to sail around the world, you know. Oh, bother. And he was so interested in his game of bowls, he finished playing before going out to fight the Spanish. Now there's a dedicated man for ye. Bernice, you know full well he couldn't leave the harbor till the tide turned in his favor. So he put on a show for the townsfolk to keep up morale. Just as Winnie's been doing on the wireless. Boost morale. Can I touch it, Da? I would be careful. You need to wear these gloves to handle it, son. Did you know legend says it sometimes sounds a warning during times of danger? The curator of Bucklands swears he heard it beat the day our soldiers were rescued from the beaches of Dunkirk. For real? He heard it? To see the same Drake whose statue's on the hole? Of course tis, you blockhead! Bucklands Abbey was Sir Francis' home. I remember a poem we learned in school. Let's see. One bit of it went like this. Drake, he was a Devon man, and ruled the Devon seas. Captain Art that sleep in there below, 
Roven though his death fell, he went with heart at ease. I dream and all the time o' Plymouth Ho. Take, Take my drum, drum to England, England, hang it by the shore, strike it when your powder's running low. If the dawn sight Devon, I'll quit the port of heaven, and drum them up the channel as we drummed them long ago. I, and this is the very same drum, da? Yes, son, the one and only. And it's going to sit in our cellar tonight till we can move it to the crypt. Too right. And if you believe all that nonsense when you're finally done with them dishes, I want you to go feed the fairies at the bottom of the garden. Bangers and mash again? There's a war on, young man, in case you haven't noticed. I stood in line for half an hour to get these two sausages from the butcher and used up all this week's meat ration. By the time I got off work, sausages was all that was left except for the tripe. Oh, it's baked beans and toast the rest of the week, my son. Unless you be wanting tripe again. Oh, no. Sorry, Mum. <laughs> I'm sorry too, Brian. Ten hours a day in that wretched factory tires me out, but we need the money now your father's in a prison camp for who knows how long. Mum, guess what Nigel was telling me? Says his dad has drinks drum in their cellar tonight for safekeeping. Oh, I wouldn't believe everything that Nigel tells you, Brian. Besides, if half the stories about that drum are true, it'd be best to give it a wide berth. Folks shouldn't mess with such things. They're dangerous. Maybe it's a secret weapon, Mum. You think old Drake could keep the Nazis away? Oh, Brian, you shouldn't fill your head with such nonsense. <laughs> You'd have to bang that drum a very long time if you wanted old Sir Francis to sail up a channel again. Better to rely on the RAF and hope for the best. Now, help me clear away before you do your homework. My mum wasn't a fanciful woman and didn't hold with legends and old wives' tales. She thought it was all poppycock. What's p poppycock, Gramps? Stuff and nonsense. Foolish talk. Oh. Did you get to see the drum, Gramps? No, my boy, I didn't, and that may have been a good thing, as things turned out. But I saw some things much worse later on. Why is that? Patience. I'm coming to that. Can I go over to Nido's when I've done my homework? If you take out the trash to the dustbin first. Oh, Mom. Oh, and promise to stay away from that drum. Ready, oh, Mum. And stay away from the harbour, here. The jerrys have bombed it every night this week. Yes, Mum. And be back before blackout, mind. I usually did as I was told, but the lure of the sea is ours more than any true Devon lad can resist. Let's cut through the rail yard and see if the Ark Royal is still in port. Me Mum told me to stay away from the docks. How's your Mum going to know unless you tell her? Right said, Fred. We made our way over the rail points until we reached a place where we could see the whole harbour, but the aircraft carrier had slipped away in the twilight. We made our way homeward, taking a shortcut along the track along the cliffs. Just after the sun had dipped below the horizon, the sea mist came in, and the horizon began to darken. There would be no moon tonight, and high tide would be around midnight, a perfect night for an invasion. Bank holiday tomorrow. What say we sneak out later tonight to watch for Nazi subs? Me mom and dad are asleep before ten most nights, if there isn't an air raid. Let's meet half ten behind Red Lion. I'm game. It's a lot of hiding from those home guard chappies. That night the bombers left Plymouth alone for once. It was almost midnight when Nigel arrived behind the pub, all out of breath and giggling. <laughs> Home guard patrols saw me, but I led him on a merry chase through the churchyard. Give him the slip by hiding out in the bombed out shoe factory. I knew where they were every minute from the grasping and wheezing they were making trying to keep up with me. Core blindly, and then protecting England from the Blitzkrieg? Here, what's that? Just a barrage balloon. It must have broken loose from its mooring over the harbor. Look, it's drifting across the old dam. Look, the home guard must have mistook it for a Nazi glider. They're shooting it full of holes. You mean they actually issued those old codgers with bullets? Look, I think it's going to crash in the middle of the roundabout leading to Dartmoor. We spent a couple of hours staring into the fog looking for enemy subs once the hubbub died down. And at some point, I fell asleep. 
What would you do if you saw a sub, Gramps? Well, Curtis, we were just boys. We really hadn't thought that bit out. I woke up with a start. Someone had their hand over my mouth. Shh! Quiet! Hear that? Get off me, you Burke! Hear what? Oh, there it is again. It's just the sea. Did I fall asleep? Shh! No, listen! It comes and goes. Sounds like a motor. Motors! There it is again! That! Yeah. What is it? What is it? Does sound like motors. Lots of them. See anything? Uh uh-uh. uh. And all is quiet at the pillbox. No warning sirens from the coastal defense spotters. And they're real soldiers. With field glasses. What's that? Over there between the sea mist and the headland. I can't see nout. The sea mist keeps moving in and out. Looks like boats. Lots of boats. Run! Uh huh. You think it's the invasion? To the right, mate. Run! Tell your dad. I'll find the coast defense blokes. We took off in different directions like scalded cats and making just about as much noise. Gosh, Gramps, was it the Nazis? Well now, Curtis, did your history books ever tell you that England was invaded during the war? No, but what did you see then? You tell me. The authorities sure didn't believe me, but they sure had some choice words for me when I found them. Help! Please, help! You there, boy. What are you doing out after curfew? They're coming. Answer me, boy. You're in a pack of trouble now. What's your name, boy? You don't understand. Name? Your parents shall hear about this. Brian, sir. Brian Butcher. Where do you live, boy? Farnington Cottage. But, sir... Where's that? In the mews off New Dartmoor Lane. But, sir... I know of it, sir. Uh, Near the Red Lion. He's Sapper Butcher's lad. His dad was captured at Dunkirk. Mister, please. We saw boats, lots of them near the headland. Oh, boats, you say. I don't believe it. Foolish imaginations. Well, how many, son? Dozens, I think. The sea mist was moving all the time. Oh, stuff and nonsense. There's a storm brewing. I don't believe it. Should I send out a patrol boat, sir? A waste of time. A fool's errand. The R-Net would have spotted something. Well, yes, sir, but R is for detecting aircraft. It may not pick up small boats. Corporal, have this young hooligan escorted home and tell his parents to give him a good thrashing for breaking curfew and wasting the home guard's valuable time. There's a war on, you know. Yes, sir. Do tell, you pompous old fart. Let's go, lad. We've had enough excitement for one night. Keep it dark, lad. Your dad's a good bloke. Ta, sir. My mother was not impressed when she caught me crawling through my bedroom window. I got my ears boxed for my efforts and grounded after school for two weeks. That may have been part of the reason my mother sent me here to Canada. I was still too worked up to sleep, and I lay awake listening to the wind as it gathered strength when a knock came at my window. Who's there? Herman Gehring, you Burke, open up. Quiet, you pillock. I'm in it already. You won't believe it. I got home just as me dad was taking Drake Strom to the crypt. Brian, the legend is true. Get off. No, me dad had borrowed Mr. Allison's barrel, and he was wheeling it down the road with some other stuff when... <laughs> da, da, hold up a mo. The Jerry's, we need to get help. Whoa, hold up there half a tick, son. Da, me and Brian saw him. The Jerry's, they're here. Hundreds of boats. Slow down, son. Tell me what you think you saw. It's the invasion. We were down by the headlands looking for subs, and we saw them. Boats too many to count. Heard their motors, too, coming through the sea mist. Are you sure? Why hasn't the alarm been raised by the coast watchers? Brian went to tell the home guard patrol. I I don't know. Then that old drum let out a beat all by itself. Danier upset the barrel and went white as a sheet. That drum went boom, 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 about four or five times, right there in the street. Drum. The drum! It's beating all by itself! The legend is true. Da? True! Dad took off for the nick, pushing the barrel and me running hard behind just to keep up. He believed you? More like he believed the drum. What you doing, Da? This. If England ever needed to conjure up old Sir Francis again, this is the...
time. Found the copper at the Nick and convinced him to call the home office. Uh, someone's coming down to talk to us first thing in the morning. Oh no, I'm dead. Me mom will kill me. Uh, nah, my dad went mad. He called the home office, broke some choice words for not acting right now. They sent us packing until tomorrow. Haven't seen Dad so scared since that landmine fell into the neighbor's garden last winter. Do you really think the hunt has landed then? Maybe. I have to have a look-see. Mom will kill me, but I gotta know too. We stole off in the darkness, weaving our way through the blacked-out streets, avoiding the few home guard patrols that were out in the storm. The wind covered any noise we made as we scampered through the rubble. Blimey, it has gotten dark tonight. No moon, heavy clouds. No patrols flying in this weather. Uh, the beach is down there, right? Yep, just keep going past the churchyard, then left along the coast path. Here we go. Recognize that oak with a broken branch? right oh, here's the path. Hey, what's that? We clambered down our secret path, past tufts of seagrass, overexposed rocks, and scrub brushes that were clinging to the scrabble soil. Our curiosity was so strong we forgot to be afraid. Then, part way down, we discovered something that none of the history books will ever admit to have happened. But we were there. We know what we saw. Look, there's something glowing out to sea. There, around in the headlands. I see it too. What is it? It looks like a... But it can't be. Looks like an old pirate ship. A three-master glowing like a banshee in the storm. I see a lot of ships. Maybe a dozen. And as quiet as ghosts. Now they're turning in. Heading right for the motorboats. Those aren't motorboats. They're landing barges the Jerry's are invading. They're nearly ashore and nobody on coastal defense has noticed yet. Blimey! Some of the ships look like their sails and masts are burning with awful green flames. The motors. They're shut off. The landing barges are running crazy. There's three of them on fire hitting each other. For a long time we couldn't move, overcome by what we were seeing. Then slowly we began to move. We found our way down the pebble beach. I saw things that night I wish I could forget. Awful things. We found dozens of wooden barges smashed on the rocks, lying helter-skelter on the gravel narrow beach at the bottom of the cliffs. Many of them were charred and burned. The tide had turned and was now ebbing, but with each roller that came ashore, bits and bobs of German equipment were revealed in the sand. Helmets, bandoliers, belts and rifles, boots and boxes. Were there any soldiers, Gramps? Yes, sweetheart, two or three, bobbing in the shallow water or half buried in the sand. All dead. Oh. i never seen a drowned man before. I don't want to ever again. Listen, what's that? It's Bloody Grot's soldier! Oh! Ryan, you kicked him! He's hot! You kicked him, Gramps? I'm ashamed to say I did. I suppose all the anger of having my dad locked up in a prison camp suddenly took me over for a moment. It still wasn't the right thing to do. Then what happened, Gramps? Well, Curtis, the soldier started screaming. And not from pain. He must have been half out of his mind with fear. Was that easy? I don't know. He's bad hurt and all burned like. What hat the Geisterschiffe sie brennen? Ein Feuersturm versenkt uns überall Wasser. Oi, what are you lads doing down here? You again? Come along with me. You're both in for it now. The boys, you will be taken home, and your parents will be informed to keep you there. If you breathe a word of what you have seen or heard to anyone, I'll have you shot. Is that understood? Yes, sir. Now, at 900 hours tomorrow, you will report to me with your parents at the guard station by the harbor. Corporal, escort these young ruffians home. Sir, yes, sir. Move it, you two, and stick to the path. There's supposed to be mines everywhere down here. We could have been killed back there. But I remember something that Kraut yelled. I mean, Dad knows a bit of German from the Great War. Quiet, Nigel. We're already for it. Forget it. No, you don't understand. I recognized a couple of words that Kraut was hollering. He was going on about ghost ships or something like that. Do you think? Quiet, you two. Now march. I think it was Drake. He answered his drum. Oh, Gramps. What did happen? Was... was it? Was it Drake's ghost? 
Who knows for sure, kids? I know what I saw. Jerry barges burned on the English coast and dead and dying Germans. Nigel and I were told to never speak of it again. I don't think it matters much now after 60 years, though. Next day, there was no sign of anything on that beach, not so much as a belt buckle. Everything was cleared away in the night. Why, Gramps? I'm not sure, sweetheart. Perhaps Churchill didn't want to frighten the people with the news of how close we came to being invaded. My mum scolded me steady for weeks after that. She couldn't understand how a boy could do something so stupid as to steal down to a mined beach in the middle of the night. To be honest, when I look back at it, neither can I. You kids would never do anything that crazy, would you? No, no Gramps. Gramps. Did Drake really come back and drive off the Nazis in that night, Gramps? Nigel swore that his dad saw a blue flaming ship on the horizon as he walked back home from the crypt. And we saw what we saw, Nigel and I. If you believe the old poem, maybe Sir Francis did come. That gale did blow out of nowhere and stopped just as quick. And, well, most of the barges we saw were burned. Did you know how Drake defeated the Spaniards? No, Gramps. He crept up on the Spanish fleet in the dark. He set fire to some old ships and then sent them sailing into the middle of the Spanish formation. The flotilla was driven all over the channel trying to avoid Drake's fire ships, and the storm did the rest. Nigel and I saw pretty much the same maneuver. So who knows for sure? Did you ever see Nigel again after your mom sent you to Canada? No, son. I received a letter from my mother a few months after I arrived in the fort. Nigel never made it. His house took a direct hit one night. Both he and his father were killed. Everyone else in the family got out without a scratch. I'm sorry, Gramps. Me too. Until the day she died, my mother swore that they died because they played around with that cursed drum, as she called it. And she may have been right. But then it happened a very long time ago. Did you go back to live in Plymouth when the war was over, Gramps? No, dear. My mother felt I'd have a better life if I stayed here. The war ruined Britain in many ways. My mother had to give up her job when the war ended, and my own dad didn't get released from the army until the Christmas of 1947. Mum said in the letter that food was still rationed in England until the 1950s. But I did visit home a number of times after I finished college and before my mum passed away. Canada's been very good to me, and she's given me opportunities I would never have gotten if I'd returned to Plymouth. The Ghost Ship was written by David Irwin. Our cast this evening, roughly in their order of appearance, featured Jeffrey Adams as the news announcer and the officer, Ellie Nelson portrayed Curtis, Dave Irwin was Gramps, Rachel Adams portrayed Brianna and Nigel, Jacelyn Sumner was Brian, Justin Kapla played Nigel's Da and the Corporal. Diane Adams was Nigel's mom. Victoria Olson was Brian's mom. Tom Bement portrayed the commander. And Tomas Rippert was the injured soldier. The Ghost Ship was directed and post-produced by Jeffrey Adams. Sound effects designed and realized by Dave Irwin. This production copyright 2012 by the Icebox Radio Theater. All rights reserved. On the web at iceboxradio.org.